Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to ABC. My name is Sean Russell, and I'm the operations director here at the church, and I'm the first to welcome you to the first Sunday in 2019, so welcome. Um, so we've got these green Connect cards in the seats in front of you. I'd ask you to just grab these, fill these out for us. Um, we like to know that you're here. We want to get to know you. We want to connect with you. Um, so as the ushers come around, please make sure that you fill these out. We count it an honor and a privilege to pray for you guys each and every week. And so the best way we can do that is if you fill this out for us. Um, we, we do care deeply. We want to get to know you. If you're visiting or you're new to the church, um, please head out to the courtyard after service. to the green tent just outside the main doors. You can meet with our pastors, talk with our staff, get connected to ABC, some of our ministries and things that are going on around the church. We do want to get to know you and plug you into the best ways we possibly can. And if you're new, we'd love to give you a welcome bag and welcome you to the church. It's got a few gifts in there, and it's a nice way for us to say thanks for coming. Um, so as you likely saw in the handout, it's the State of the Church weekend uh, here at ABC, and it's a great opportunity for us to kind of share what's happened in 2018 through God's provision, through God's people. Uh, we get to share some of the highlights, some of the amazing thing that God has done through the church and through his people in the last year, and kind of look forward to 2019 and paint a picture of where we hope to go in the next year. And so um, as we open that up, um, I think the biggest thing for us is that God's provision was amazing this past year. He is so faithful and good to this church. And you'll see it in the financials. We'll get through those numbers, and they'll explain those a little bit more as we go through it. But we're just so grateful how God provides through his people for this church this last year. And, um, and with that as a backdrop, I'd love to invite our ushers down and then pray for our offering. Lord, uh, we are grateful. Uh, we're grateful for today, just the opportunity to gather here, Lord. Uh, and just feel your presence, and, and that song, hallelujah, amen. Uh, what an amazing song to end with in worship, Lord, and, and that we come together today um, to worship you, Lord, to serve you. We're grateful for all the things, all the resources you've given us, all the time, the talents, the treasures that each one of us has been bestowed, Lord, and we pray we can use those for your glory, Lord. We're grateful for the opportunity to be here this morning. We pray that we can do that well. We're thankful for the message that's about to be uh, shared, and we're thankful for each one that's here, Lord. And so we pray this all in your name. Amen. and Happy New Year. I'm Kelsey Iverson, and I've got a few announcements for you today. The first one is that we're going to be starting a new class this Monday, January 7th at 6.30. It's called Changes That Heal, and it's going to be looking at how to understand your past to ensure a healthier future. The next announcement is that we're going to be starting up our women's ministry Bible studies this coming week. Make sure to look in your bulletin for more information, and you can also go out onto the courtyard in between services and after the 11 o'clock for more information. We also have our January Mom to Mom coming up this Thursday at 9 a.m. over in Student Center 1. Make sure to register your kids for childcare before this Monday. We'd love to see you there. The last announcement is that we're going to be starting up a new sermon series on January 13th going through the book of Genesis. Hope you have a great rest of your Sunday. Well, good morning. It's good to see you. Happy New Year, everyone. There we go. Happy New Year. This is an interactive service right here. This is amazing. So yeah, can you believe it's 2019? I just can't believe it, man. God is uh, God's amazing in terms of just the speed that things seem to be happening. This morning, um, Psalm 103, I'd like to, to share with you just to kind of kick things off here on our, our uh, morning. It says this, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits. Forget none of his blessings. This morning we really do want to focus on what is it that the Lord has blessed us with. God says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. And don't forget what God has done. I think it's helpful for us as individuals and as a church family to reflect back on what is it that God has done this past year? What is it that God has done in your family, in your life over 2018? And what do you anticipate? What are some goals for the, for the future? Have you talked about that? Have you talked about maybe even kind of reviewing what happened and where you want to go as a family, your finances before, and where you'd like to be in the future? All of those kinds of things. God is pleased when we do that. And then it goes on and it says this. 
God is the one who pardons all of our iniquities, heals all your diseases, redeems you from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion, who satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like an eagle. Specifically, God says to us, don't forget don't forget any of the things that God has done in your life. Not the things like, for example, the pardon of your iniquities, that God has delivered you out of darkness. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ here today, God has forgiven your sins. Then you walk in newness of life. He heals you. He redeems your life from the pit. Don't forget that. See, God is most pleased when he sees his children walking in a way that is redemptive. He has redeemed you. He has delivered you out of darkness. He's raised you out of that pit. And he loves to see you walk and thrive. Just like we as parents, you know. Some of us who are a little older, when we see our adult children, you know, making good decisions, walking with the Lord, seeing their children, you know, begin to embrace the Lord. There's nothing that makes us happier than to see our children walking in that way. And so it is that God is blessed. God is blessed when his people begin to manifest the changes that he has initiated in our own lives that gives satisfaction to our life. He wants us to live a satisfied life so that even when we're old, we're renewed like we are young people. That's literally what he says here today. And so we today are are privileged to be able to have what we call our State of the Church Address. It's kind of a family talk. It's a reminder of who we are and what we're about and where we've come from and where God has taken us, we think perhaps in the future. And so it's an opportunity. If you're brand new here, um, you know, it's a little different than our regular weeks. Every week we preach straight from the Bible and all of that. And, and yet this week we want to take time out to reflect upon the blessings of God in our church and just to remind ourselves what, our, what we're all about. If you have your bulletins here today, Take the back page and look at this. Our mission statement and core values. At ABC, our mission is to engage with our community, connect with God and others, grow spiritually, and multiply disciples. These are not just words on the paper. This is how we run. This is what we think about. This is when we talk about in our staff meetings, when we talk about with our elders, when we pray, when we strategize, we say, Lord, how can we engage more people in our community how can we get people to connect with you and connect with other people because people just aren't going to grow unless they connect to you and connect to others how do we help people grow what does that look like specifically and how do we multiply disciples over a decade ago now taking our mission statement back then which was life transformation that ABC exists for for life transformation we said so what does life transformation look like we came up with 10 steps 10 steps of life transformation and literally that's what we kind of measure everything by are people taking progressively these 10 steps of life transformation but we also have uh, our core values and our core values are, are, are different are different than our mission statement. The core values are different than even the 10 steps of life transformation. These are the ways in which we operate. And we say as a church body, as a family of God, we want to submit to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. In other words, we make our plans, there's no doubt about it, but God directs our path. And so we know that the Holy Spirit is leading. And I think for 2018 in my own life, I think God really, really wanted to teach me this lesson in in an amazing way because it just seems like I kind of came down to a daily dependence upon God for what's next, you know, particularly dealing with aging parents and all the other things that have transpired in our lives, man. It's just like, God, I have no idea what's next. I, I don't know what to do next. And every day, God just seems to be providing manna, like the children of Israel in the desert, you know, what I need for that day. We follow the Holy Spirit. We unashamedly preach God's Word. If you know anything about ABC, you know that we are a Bible-teaching church, and we always have been, just from the Word of God. And we don't, we don't apologize for that. We literally don't. If the, if the Word of God says it, even though our society is at odds with it, we proclaim it. And that's so challenging, and it's getting harder you know, I, I look at, at some of the younger people that are going to, you know, kind of be moving, continually taking this church forward uh, after I'm long gone, and I think, boy, 
It's getting harder and harder. But my prayer is that we never, ever, ever leave that foundation. And that is, is that we preach the word of God regardless of what the world says. Third, we wholeheartedly invest in the next generation. This is a part of our DNA. It always has been from day one. We've always looked at the next generation of leaders and said, you know what? We want to invest in them because of the future of our church. And we have seen that time and time again. It came from my own experience. My own experience in coming to Christ in, in high school and then having some guys at the church kind of say, hey, you know what, Tom, we think you, you might be able to do some things here. And they invited me to join them as an intern at the church that I went to and, and, and gave me way more responsibility than I deserved, certainly. And I was way over my head. And yet the Lord taught me a lot of lessons. I'm here today because of those people who believed in me and challenged me way back then. And, and we just believe in that. That's who we are as a church. We've always been that way. We invest heavily in that. And, and the fact that we take so many young people to Hume Lake and all the other kinds of things that we do on missions trips and other things are, are, are evidence of that. Uh, we, we take the, the Great Commission literally. I mean, we literally do. I mean, in other words, we believe that God wants us to make disciples of all nations. And so when we, when we talk about missions, it's not just, you know, the names of faces of some of our missionaries. It's literally not only what the, who they are, but what they're doing. And we have five strategic initiatives that really drive everything that we do as we partner with indigenous people to reach the most unreached in the world. In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And we have an ends of the earth strategy that's amazing. And we've talked about that a lot. But the thing that I'm most excited about this past year the thing I'm most excited about was our inner city in Oakland on 1717 10th Avenue in uh, downtown Oakland there. We have a home now where the people who are being trained theologically at San Quentin Prison, when they are released, who those guys who say, I want to plant churches in the inner city, I want to change the community that I came from, they have an opportunity to go back there and live in that home, be discipled and mentored for two years as they launch out, begin church planting. We believe, and we're praying, that this is the genesis, that this is a seed that is replicated and reproduced all around the country so that God wins back the inner cities of America. Amen? I mean, we are so excited about this. Crazy thing is the state of California is actually paying to train these guys theologically in our prison system. Can you believe that? They're allowing for Toomey. I mean, it's California, for goodness sakes, you know? Anyway, so it's exciting what God's doing. And when these guys are released, you know, and, and in a couple of weeks we've got another video. It's really exciting to be able to share with you of what God's doing there and, and investing. And by the way, thank you. Some of you have individually helped us in this investment in a significant way that's really moved things forward for them in a big way. We're grateful for that. Thank you for that. We recognize that, that community is essential for growth. People do not grow spiritually simply by coming to church and sitting here and listening to the outstanding preaching that is every week. I mean, as great as this preaching is, people grow when they're in community and connected to other people. When people recognize that, you know what, when I'm honest with somebody else and I open up my life and I invite them into my life, things start moving forward for me spiritually. I appreciate the fact that you're here. That's great. It's a great start. But it's just a start. Connecting is, is key, and we want to help people connect. We, we also know that sacrifice for the sake of others is critical, that, that really you're not going to take that next step forward until you start sacrificing, you start prioritizing, you start saying no to some things to yourself to be able to say yes to others, to be able to deliberately make a sacrifice in a significant way. And we place a high priority on godly leadership. It's got to be real. It really does. And, and here's the thing. You know, some of you might be sitting here and say, well, why do you have a service like this? You know, why is it that, you know, you're, you're doing this on a Sunday? We just want to hear from straight from the Bible for the whole time. Here's, here's why we have a, a, a time like this annually. It's because we want every one of you, ideally, every one of you, to be able to have a sense of confidence in the integrity of our church and the way it operates. And for some of you, you know, you say, you know, I, I don't care. I, you know, I, I trust you guys. That's good. You guys are good. That's great. That's some of you. But that's, that's less and less of you, believe it or not. Because, you know, the millennials coming up right now, they walk into a campus like this and they look around. They don't trust anything about it. 
they don't the fact that it is big and that it looks like a you know a well-run operation and all those other kinds of things that actually creates more suspicion for them for us to be transparent for us to be as honest as we can and in the sense of being able to communicate in a way that everybody understands and, and all those other kinds of things is very very helpful and we think it's important we believe in transparency we believe it's got to be real it's got to be it's got to be genuine let me tell you one story, and then I'm going to uh, turn it off. By the way, when we look at these, these goals and those kinds of things, when we talk about new groups, we talk about people you know, joining new groups, starting new groups, people who join new groups, number of people baptized, and these engagements, you can see those numbers here. They are very ambitious. Now, on the, on the top couple, we're doing really well. We're almost a year and a half into this. We have two more years. But when we talk about baptisms and new engagements, man, we got a long ways to go. we got two years, 19 and 20, to be able to see over 300 people baptized. We're trusting God for that. You know, we, we, we're excited about that. But that motivates us because baptism is a step in a person's life spiritually that says, not only have I embraced Christ, but I want to be obedient to him. It is a huge indicator of a person saying, I'm, I'm willing to, to be obedient to Christ and identify with him. And in terms of new engagements, you know, we don't just like, hey, you know, we had 2,500 people in the stadium at Easter. I'll bet half of those people were, were new and right down 1,200 people. Wow, great. No, these are actually 1,206 people that we know their names and we know they're not currently engaged at our church and we know that they're new. We're, we're diligent in tracking these people because we think that every number is a name you'll hear that again today but it truly is and that every name matters to God and so we want to talk about specific encounters with people that we know is a brand new engagement it it moves us forward let me share you uh, with you one story since I'm the old guy I get to share stories from way back you know so um a number of years ago um I, I approached a guy that, um, that had the apartments across the street. His name is Jerry Clay. Some of you know who he is. He's a city councilman for a while and, and all of that. And, and years ago, as our church was on this rapid growth pace and all, parking was always an issue, real challenges. Our campus didn't look like it did today. Uh, we, we just had the parking that was right just immediately along this strip, and so we were everywhere. And and, and I just said, hey, Jerry, you know what? If you ever decide to sell the apartments that right across the street, I said, if you ever s decide to sell them, would you let us know first? And he said, oh, absolutely, you know. And so hadn't heard from him for years, and I touched base with him every once in a while and, and all of that. And in 2006, when we had launched the, this ambitious building campaign to build our student center, which not only included building that student center, but meant that we had to buy a little tiny house that the Williams owned right there, tear down all of the buildings that North County Christian School was using at the time, okay, to build that building there, to create more parking, and then this courtyard area that we have now at this cafe. Huge project, biggest one we'd ever undertaken, okay, 2006. Guess when Jerry Clay comes to me and says, hey, Tom, I want to sell the apartments. 2006. I mean, it's my luck. It's just the way it is. You know, so I said, Jerry, you got to be kidding me, man. I'd almost any other time you could have approached us, it would have been doable. But right now, I said, I got to be honest, it's, it seems impossible to me. And I said, but I'll, I'll, I'll run it by our leaders. Well, and I kid you not, the same week, this, you know, this gal comes who's a single lady, and she says, hey, Tom, she says, um, I don't have any children. She says, my mom just passed away and left me some money. She said, I live okay. I'm, I'm comfortable. I'm fine. I really want to take this money that she has left me, and I want to give it to the church. What do you feel like God really wants you to do? And I, and I said, you know, I said, here's the thing is that we've been praying about the possibility of the apartments across the street, and what I feel like God has given me this kind of thing in my heart. I said, I'd love to see it be a training center for young people. And so we by, just kind of called it the ABC Lifehouse. And so I kind of painted the vision of what an ABC Lifehouse might look like. And she says, that sounds fantastic. And she gave almost $200,000 as a down payment to be able to purchase that so that we could move forward. And then you know what happened? 2008 happened. 
Some of you remember 2008, 2009? Yeah, the first year of our actual giving and of our building program, the economy crashes. We had this big loan to help us. We're going to, quote, pay off in three years, which took us seven. Uh, Anyway, to be able to do all those things hit. And you know what happened to the vision for the ABC Lifehouse? It died with the economy. It, it was just an impossibility at the time, you know. Things changed so dramatically financially that it's like I said, okay, God, I guess maybe that was just my dream. I guess it wasn't your dream. And, you know, to come to grips with that, you know, when seemingly there's all that momentum and everything else, and just to say, all right, and to give that up was something that I think God wanted to do in my heart. And, you know, when I look back at 2018, the thing that I'm most excited about, like, head and shoulders above everything else is the fact that God in his mercy and grace allowed for that dream to come back and it didn't come back through me Jeff Atherstone who spent a decade in Uganda with university and young people working with young people when he came back and he remembered he actually remembered the vision he remembered the dream you know and 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 Zach Talbert who is involved in our as our pastor of student ministries, who when he was at Long Beach State was in Navigators, heavy emphasis on discipleship, understands accountability and those kinds of things, leadership training, did, did this leadership thing at the junior high that was just amazing, you know, and believing that junior hires could actually be leaders and all that. The two kind of came together and envisioned what would it look like. And so it was reborn under the name of the ABC Lifehouse. And today we've got, uh, is it 13? 13 young people living across the street in a live-in mentoring program called the Church Leadership Project. And, uh, and, and doing the kinds of things that not only I envisioned, but far beyond anything I ever envisioned. God is so good. Sometimes, you know, with the death of a vision, there is the direction of the Holy Spirit when God says, not now, not yet, it's not my timing, and he rebrings it back in a new way with a rebirth that's so much better than anything that I ever envisioned. And I just got to say, God is so good. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Amen? All right, I'm going to invite Jeff Atherstone to come on up, and uh, then Jeff Erke will come up after him. All right. Okay, it's the new year, and I want to talk about you and your growth for just a little bit. How many of you are ambitious goal setters? You don't just have one New Year's resolution. You have one for every month and a few subcategories to help you achieve those goals, right? We're there? Some of you, you probably are already waffling on the resolution, and it's already dead and buried, right? Okay, we're all a little different when it comes to goals, but I want to give you a goal today. I want you to take the next step for your spiritual growth, okay? Now, we talk about engage, connect, grow, multiply. That is actually a path for growth. That's a path for life transformation. And for those of you who love a low bar, congratulations. If you are sitting here and we know your name, you've been engaged. Good job. Way to go. Accomplish one goal already, all right? If you're here, we don't know your name, come to the booth afterwards. Congratulations, you've hit one goal. But for many people, they could slide in and out of church for years and never be known. But we all know that there's a point in life where we need other people, we hit a crisis where we need help, and that's where connecting is so important. And here at ABC, we have a path for connection for you. It's called our Connections class. It's a five-week class. It's during the 11 o'clock service. It starts on January 27th, and for five weeks, you get to sit in a small group led by one of the pastors here at the church. Uh, Tom, Jeff, Brandon, myself, uh, take a time each week to sit down and share with you what ABC is all about. We, we spell everything. There is no question that you cannot ask. If you have deep theological questions or cultural questions or just how do you guys deal with this kind of questions, that is your place and your space to connect with the pastors. But also it's important to connect with other people. I have described the courtyard at ABC as an awkward junior high dance. I know something about awkward in junior high. It seems like everyone out there knows someone else, has a friend, has a group, they're connected, they belong, and oftentimes when you're new to ABC or you haven't connected, it just is one of those places where you, it's a social setting, you just want to leave quickly and get to your car. 
Uh, the Connections class is just a great opportunity for you to meet a small group of people and intentionally get to know their names, get to know about them personally, so you have your group, your people when you come to church. That's how we connect at ABC. It doesn't matter if you have been here for four years, five years, six years, seven years. You could take that class at any time. We've had so many people over the last year kind of embarrassed, kind of shy, come through the class after being here for three years, four years, five years, and each of them said, wow, that was helpful. I did learn something new about my church. All right, so it's never too late. If you still feel awkward when you come to church like you don't know anyone, even if you've been here for a decade, start with connections. The next step is grow. And we believe that people grow in circles, not in rows. You are seated in rows right now. None of you is asking questions. If you do, I will not answer it, all right? This is not a classroom setting. This is not a discussion type of setting. And so it's, a, it's an information dump is what sermons often are. And you could get something from that. But we grow when we get to interact with information, when we get to interact with teachers. And I want to encourage you this year, if you're connected but you're ready to grow, take the next step and get involved in a group where you can grow. We have all kinds of different groups here at ABC where you can grow. Uh, the one that I am most excited about this year is starting tomorrow night, 6.30, in the Student Center. It's a class called Changes That Heal. Uh, it's a class where you get to understand your past and how it impacts you and well, the changes that you can make for a better future. Um, it's kind of like an entry-level beginner's CR class, Celebrate Recovery class. Uh, and so if you're interested in that class, just show up tomorrow night, six weeks, it'll change your life. Another great place to start to get involved in a group is Celebrate Recovery. Now everyone says, oh, Celebrate Recovery is not for me. I don't have a problem with drugs or alcohol. That is like one-third of the group. Celebrate Recovery is for anyone with a hurt, with a habit, or a hang-up that they want help to overcome. There's men's groups and women's groups for Celebrate Recovery on Monday nights, and then we have a Celebrate Recovery service on Thursday nights. That is a great place to, to just jump into for a season of in-depth growth. Uh, we also have our men's and women's ministries. They're listed there in the bulletin today, and the women's ministry has a booth out of the courtyard. Just go out there and find out if there's a study that's a fit for you. Uh, we also have a Financial Peace University course coming up on February the 6th. Uh, that is not a money class. It's a behavior class. We all behave differently with money, and most of us misbehave. A lot of times it leads to fights and arguments and very poor seasons of marriages, and we don't know how to escape. Financial Peace University helps you understand your attitudes and your behaviors towards money and how to change them and how to work together with your partner, with your spouse to achieve your goals. Uh, that is a fabulous place. Uh, I think it's a great marriage class and sometimes it deals with finances. So if you're interested in that, we've got Financial Peace University. And finally, for your growth, we have community groups. And community groups are just the best place to belong. Uh, it's a great group where you could just jump in with a group of people, go over the sermon notes from the week, and really talk about how are you applying the scriptures, what can you do, how can you interact with it, and, and have a group that's praying for you and knows you and is helping you grow. Uh, you could sign up for a community group any week at the Connections booth here at ABC. The final step for growth is multiply. And if you've been in a group for a long time and, and you've just kind of going through the motions, I would encourage you, have a conversation with your group later and say, hey, so what's the next step for me? How do you think I can invest in other people's lives this next year? Should I be leading a group? Is there some other way? Have that conversation with them uh, and begin that process of multiplication. Uh, we have one very exciting change that's taking place this year in our high school ministry. They are actually leading the charge changing from uh, rows to circles. And uh, our youth pastor, Zach Talbert, put together a great video to explain this change in our high school ministry. Take a look right now. At, a at ABC Student Ministries, our vision is to empower the next generation of leaders to fearlessly transform the world. We believe that our high school students are leaders, and we want to see them reach their world for Jesus. We've seen amazing things in our high school student ministries program recently. We've seen them engaging in hard questions at the Rethink Conference, seeing God move at Hume Lake, serving the community together at Project 805, growing alongside their friends at the Awaken Conference, running camps for the children of Ecuador, and so much more. And even with this growth in our student ministries, the culture around us is shifting. We can all see it. 
Christianity is under attack in academia and public discourse and in homes. Our high school students need to be prepared for this tumultuous attack. One of our main goals in student ministries is to create an environment of genuine community. High school students, like all of us, deeply crave relationship and community. They desire a sense of belonging and to serve a cause greater than themselves. As a student ministries team, realizing a need for genuine community and viewing the culture at hand, we've prayed and studied trends in student ministries around the country, and we're excited to announce a shift to our high school program. Starting January 23rd, we are going to be switching to a home group format for our high school students on Wednesday nights. There will be four different homes hosting the four grade levels. Students will connect while eating together, investigating the truth of the Bible together, and still participating in accountability and growth within their smaller hub group alongside their peers and their hub group leaders. We will provide students with meaningful discipleship during these times that are essential to their growth. Additionally, we will be adding a Sunday morning service for our high schoolers at the 11 o'clock service beginning January 27th. We are excited to once again provide our students with a Sunday morning service designed for them, and we're hopeful that they will have a renewed passion of inviting their friends to church and attending church themselves. This will be a time for students to engage in worship with their peers, reflect on what God is showing them, and hear clear and relevant truth from God's Word. Thank you so much for your support of our students. To have a congregation that believes so much in the next generation and continues to invest in them means more than you know. All right. It's, it's really exciting. When I start to see things shift and move and, and change in our church, uh, high school ministries trying to adapt to the, the culture that's shifting, uh, Jeff talking about the different opportunities we have to engage, connect, and grow, and then we even look at some of these numbers. It just makes me so excited, you guys, because I see that our church is moving and we, we're going somewhere, and God's continuing to work in our church, and he's continuing to grow, and he's continuing to challenge and shape who we are as a church, and he's accomplishing his purposes in his church. And I just get pumped. I hope you guys are excited to see this. Um, but if you're looking through this, and if you're inherently like me, I'm not a numbers guy uh, by nature, and I've I've kind of processed through this stuff, and as we work through it as a team, I've realized that this is so helpful because I wouldn't normally probably say, okay, let's put this number here and that number there and let's set a goal for this and that. But I've realized that this becomes a really helpful dashboard to see how we're doing as a church. Are we successful? Are we healthy? Is God continuing to work? Are people's lives continuing to be changed? Are we doing our part in God's kingdom as a part of this church? And so I've grown to really appreciate these numbers and see that this is an indication of how healthy our church is. And, and then the, the same goes for finances. And as Tom mentioned before, in an effort to be transparent and to be really clear in terms of our communication, I want to just give you a little slice of a financial report, just a very brief financial report, so you can see this is how we're doing financially. Again, I think, uh, you know, numbers aren't everything, but it's a really helpful indicator to see where we're at. So take out this little half sheet that's in your bulletin there. There's a side that says 2018 finances. I want to just talk through that with you really quickly. If you were to look at the income line there, as year-to-date report income says $2.5 million, that's all of the income that came into our church in 2018. Now, most of that is general fund tithes and offerings that you all have faithfully contributed to our church. Um, there is other dollars that come in uh, towards missions, towards benevolence. Uh, we have some income that uh, is produced off of the property for rentals and leases and whatnot. Um, and so that's the total income for our church in 2018. And then if you look at our expenses at 2.2 million, uh, obviously that's less than what we brought in. And so that's uh, according to our budget managers, those that manage the finances for different ministry areas. Um, a big chunk of that is our personnel budget. It, um, obviously, and then we've got money that we're committing to missions, money that we're committing to outreach, to benevolence, these initiatives and projects and whatnot. But the bottom line is, at the end of the year, and this is a very pr preliminary number, it's only January 6th, um, so we have a little bit of time to close out the year still. It looks like we've got well over $200,000 surplus. And some of you might ask, okay, well, where does that money go? That money's really going into infrastructure. So there's a couple things that we're working towards doing. One is we've spent the last year— almost two years developing systems 
And I think systems are really important for a church of our size. Uh, we need to know that the, the organizational side is well-oiled and that it's functioning well. You need to have confidence in your church uh, when you make a donation. You need to have confidence in your church when you invite a friend to come be a part of your church for you to be able to say, hey, I trust these guys. I trust this organization because I've seen under the hood and I, I know that there's a lot of accountability with our boards and the, the processes that we have. And so it's really important for me that you guys have confidence in that process. So we're um, basically investing in some systems that help us to plan well for the future. Uh, we're, we've got a five-year plan to build up a bit of a reserve fund that would carry us for about 90 days if there were some sort of emergency. Um, there's different numbers that people have in the nonprofit world. It's uh, usually three to six months of operating expenses that you should have in the bank. We, we don't have anywhere near that yet, but we've got about a five-year plan to say, let's, let's put a little bit of money. I don't think it's um, probably the most uh, ministry-minded, biblical approach to stack up a bunch of money in the savings account as a church. You guys are all giving and sacrificing and investing in our church so that th those dollars can go into ministry, into outreach, into missions, into our own programs. You're not donating money so that it sits and earns interest in a savings account. Um, that's not the goal. But that being said, there's a piece of stewardship that says we should probably have um, a little bit of a plan in place. So that's part of our systems development. We're working on a depreciation schedule for those of you that know business. Um, that's important to calculate depreciation on our property and our capital assets. Um, so that's part of our process. We've implemented a new finance software that's helping us to manage and track our finances. Um, we have implemented a new database management that helps us, you've seen it called My ABC, helps us to know who's who and who's involved in what. And so these are all really important things. And here's why. It comes down to why do we exist as a church? Uh, you could look at all the systems and look at all the finances and look at the investment that we're making in some of the infrastructure and go, well, so is this, is this so that we can just be comfortable and content to come warm these chairs every single weekend and have a great safe place to worship? No, because the whole point of our church is to fulfill the great commission that God has called us to, which is to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations and baptizing them and teaching them. And that's what God has called us to do. He hasn't called us to be safe and comfortable in our own little well-padded worship center at ABC. He's called us to go. And so if our church truly exists to go, we've got to have a watertight ship that can endure weather, that it can endure hardship. And so what we're doing is planning well for the future because we believe God is taking ABC into the next chapter and he's going to continue leading this church and continue growing this church. And you'll see shifts like the student ministries and other things because we want to continue reaching people to fulfill the Great Commission. But it means that this organization has to operate cleanly organized with accountability, transparency, so that you can trust and believe in your church. Does that make sense? It's, it's really important. So that's our finance report. Um, if you just look at the percentages, it's encouraging to see that giving is up 12%. Um, that's, uh, that's an amazing way that God has provided for our church. That's where the majority of this surplus comes. It's not because we saved a bunch of money on our operating costs. Um, and so that's a huge thank you to you that have committed and invested in our church. Um, and our spending was down a bit, but not near 12%. Um, certainly our attendance is up a little bit over last year um, as we kind of look at all those numbers. But turn over to the other side. I want to give you a little slice of the plan for this coming year. And the way we build our budget, again, just so you understand the process, is we take a look at the income from the previous year, so 2018's income, and we project that out over 19 and just simply to say we think that you know, if we were to take a shot in the dark, we're trusting that God would provide about the same amount of resources that he did last year. That's just the best way we can make an estimate. So we're saying 2018 income projected into 2019. Let's build a budget on that. And you're seeing the totality of that budget, the largest line item obviously being personnel. And you might look at that, that big blue slice and go, man, that's a lot of money we spend on personnel, on staff. Well, the reality is there's 48 people on staff and so it's a decent sized staff and payroll. But we know that people invest in people. So we could spend all that money on infrastructure and on facilities and on resources and books and materials and all those things, but that doesn't necessarily invest in people as it relates to growing and discipleship 
and continuing to move forward as a church to outreach to more people, we know that people invest in people. So that's why such a large percentage of our money goes towards personnel. Secondly, we see missions. That's 15%. Um, We're continually and prayerfully seeking God's direction in our missions area with these initiatives in hopes that we could even give more someday to missions. That's 15% of total. Um, The uh, money that comes into the general fund, just another statistic for those of you that that care, Um, if the money that comes into our general fund via tithes and offerings, we take about 10% of that $10,000 a month and we commit that to missions in addition to what you all have committed to the Go Fund, which is specific giving to missions. So two sources of income for missions. I don't want to get too confusing and lost in the weeds on that, but helpful to know that we're committing our own funds that come into the church as well as funds that go specifically towards missions. And then uh, the rest of those numbers, facilities, is obvi- you know kind of a, uh, an easy <laughs> number to figure out. We've got to pay utilities and insurance and um, all that kind of stuff. The office is keeping the office running, getting things like this printed. And then the final slice of the pie there is our ministry expense. So all those multiple colors, that's the resources and the materials that we, uh, that we use for our programs and our ministries. But as we look at planning, you know, Tom alluded to this, um, this proverb 16, talking about God directing our steps. When we look at that first core value, the leadership of the Holy Spirit is so critically important to the future of our church and the life of our church. But there's an interesting uh, language that the writer of this proverb uses in chapter 16, verse 9. He says, the heart of a man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. Now, we know that God establishes our steps. We know that the Holy Spirit leads and guides and redirects even, like Tom was referring to with the Lifehouse and the Church Leadership Project. But it's interesting that he doesn't say in verse 9, that you ought not plan, God will direct your steps. That's not what he says, right? He says, no, the heart of a man makes his plan. So we're going to plan. We're going to continue to dream. We're going to continue to pray. We're going to continue to seek and discuss and talk about what God has for our church. We're going to look at the finances. We're going to look at the structure. We're going to look at the team, the staff dynamics. We're going to look at the future of where God has called us to, and we're going to make a plan. And it may not be the way it works out, but that's okay because the Holy Spirit can direct and redirect. We know that God's going to direct our steps. It doesn't mean we're not going to plan. And so as we look at these numbers, and I said uh, earlier that, you know, sometimes we're hesitant to look at numbers because it's like, I don't know, it just feels like we're, you know, just focused on metrics now all of a sudden. And we got to have these measurables and all these. The, the reality is if we don't make a plan, we go nowhere, right? If we don't dream a little bit, if we don't ask, God, what do you have for our church? And here's the thing I know to be true, is that 99 years ago, 1920, this building back here was built for a very specific reason. Now, E.G. Lewis, when he commissioned that building, he had no idea what God had planned, but God had a plan for this church, and he stuck this church right smack in the middle of this town in Atascadero because he knew that over the next hundred years, there was going to be families that were broken. There was going to be people that were hurting. There was going to be poor. There was going to be marriages that were struggling. There was going to be people without Jesus that were lost, that were going to hell, and God said, I'm going to put this church right here, right in this town, right in the middle of the North County area because there's going to be tens of thousands of lost and hurting people. And over the years, we've been able to see thousands come to ABC and receive the truth, the life-changing truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Praise God for that. But you know what? There's more. There are more people in our town. There are more people in the North County, Templeton, Paso, go out to the coast that have yet to hear of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we look at infrastructure and we look at numbers and we look at finance for a very specific reason, because we know that this gives us the opportunity to now look beyond our four walls and say, I'm not content just to warm the chair any longer. I want God to reach somebody through me. I want God to reach someone through my church. And when Jesus said in Matthew 28 to go into all the world, he he was including Atascadero. He was including North County, Templeton, Paso. When he says go, he's calling us to go, you and I. And when Jeff says New Year's goals, make some resolutions, be a part of the solution, that's a very real, tangible effort you could make as part of our church. If you look at the back of the bulletin and you take a look at those four key groups, you might look at that and go, you know what? Yeah, I want to see more people reached for Jesus at my church. 
and I can trust my church, and I hope you can, and I know that our church is going to continue doing everything that we're called to do, but I want to be part of the solution. And so my encouragement to you as we wrap up this morning is to simply look at those things and go, well, what will God have for me? What might be my part of the equation in this whole plan to reach more people for Christ? Maybe it's something really simple like joining a group. Maybe for you it's just going, yeah, I, I do need a group. I need to jump in. Maybe it's something that's, that's a little bit more challenging that you want to reach a little farther and go, you know what, I want to engage some people. I want to bring them to church. I want to bring them to a group, a Bible study. I want to bring them to a, an outreach event, a men's breakfast. And you might even set a goal for yourself. I want to have five, three, whatever that might be for you to say, I want to have this number that says 1,206. I want it to be 1,210 by the end of the year because of my investment in my community, in my neighborhood. What would God have for you? I just want to ask for you to consider that. Take this home this week and just even pray over and say, God, what would you have for me? Maybe you need to take the step of being baptized. Maybe you need to start a group. Maybe you've been in a group for a long time, like Jeff said. You might go, you know, it's time for me to step out, be part of the solution, because there's more lost people. And yeah, there's, there's a lot of stuff going on in my church, and they're doing a lot of programs and ministries, and sometimes we can say that's what they're doing. They're working on it. They're reaching people. But it's not they, it's we. And I want us to stand together as a church and say, how are we going to reach our community for Christ? And fulfill the Great Commission. It's what he's called us to. And ask that God would continue to lead us forward and provide for us along the way. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for the amazing heritage of this church. Thank you for the resources you've given us over the years and specifically this past year. Thank you for the opportunity you've given us to be a part of your kingdom and part of the solution. God, would you set in our hearts a vision, a personal goal, a target that we could aim at this year? And God, would you allow us to be part of the solution, part of the work, the ministry work, and the kingdom work that you're doing in the midst of a Tascadero Bible Church? In your name I pray. Amen.